All right, good. Um, without uh, any delay, um, I think uh, we will introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Gita Kutiniak. Uh, she's a chair for Mathematic Foundation of Artificial Intelligence at the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University, Munchen. Her research interest is very broad, and I know her from her work in harmonic analysis, compressive sensing, high dimensional data analysis. Of course, recently more on machine learning and uh, numerical mathematics, partial differential equations. And she's a recipient of um, uh, many awards and highly uh, recognized in her field, including the research prize of Gimben. Uh, how do we pronounce that? Actually, uh, a Hedenberg uh, Fellowship, uh, the Van Calvin Prize by the DFG, and uh, Aston Chair. She's a member of the Berlin uh, Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanity, uh, a SIAM fellow and so on. And also he's a uh, she's a chair of the SIAM activity group on the image sciences and the scientific director of the graduate school of BIMOS at TU Berlin. And he's currently a co-chair of the first SIAM conference on mathematics of data science. And also the chair of the GAMM uh, activity groups on mathematical signal and image processing and the computational and mathematical methods in data science. And she will give us a talk about, uh, can we open the black box of deep neural networks? Um, Gita, if you are there, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Also, thank you very much for the invitation. So let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, yeah, I think we all know um, how uh, effective deep neural networks are, but we also know, and that's also one purpose of this workshop, that it's still to some extent a black box. And so here I want to ask the question, I mean, can we open the black box, I mean, from an interpretability viewpoint? Uh, let me start my talk by introducing my collaborators on the main part. Um, that's Cosmos Heiss, who's a very bright master student at TU Berlin, uh, Ron Levy, who is a uh, brilliant PhD um, postdoc uh, at TU Berlin and also now moving with me uh, to LMU Munich. Then Sinjin Resnick, who was a PhD student uh, of Joan and well, Joan Bruna from NYU, I think everybody, everybody knows. Yeah, as I said, I think uh, deep learning is very effective. We see it all around us. I mean, think of self-driving cars, think of surveillance tasks, Legal issues, so in the States, as I became aware, I mean, often job applications are pre-screened by neural networks. Um, and so this also raises the question, I mean, can we understand how these algorithms work? And particularly the healthcare sector is a huge area where these methods are used for imaging methodologies or for computing um, reconstructions, image reconstruction, but also for reaching decisions. And as the main purpose of this workshop um, is to address that the fact or the problem that there are very few theoretical results right now explaining their success. So there's by far no, not a comprehensive theory under which we can explain why they work that well. And so, um, so this is one, one purpose and this talk might be give a small glimpse also how uh, we can aim to understand neural networks better. And that is a huge concern. I mean, everybody knows, or a lot of people, I guess, know about also this incident during one of the um, AI conferences where one of the plenary speakers, in fact, actually said that um, of machine learning algorithms just work through trial and error have become a form of alchemy in the sense. And I mean, for me, what, what is important in this whole regime is what Stephen Hawking said. Um, he said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. And I think in this area, that's something we always have to ask ourselves because we are, and these methods are used for very sensitive applications. Do we actually know enough uh, to fully understand um, these approaches? So let me start um, by briefly reviewing um, what neural networks are about, um, which then introduces us also to the area of interpretability. So a neural network, I think we all know, um, is a highly mathematical object. It is a function from RD to some RNL, which is composed out of different structures of F1 linear maps, AX plus B and activation functions. 
uh, which are applied component-wise since these are univariate functions and then um, we iterate. Uh, and so this is typically depicted in this way where we have a graph where this is our input layer. Here we start with d equal to four. These mimic the uh, F1 linear maps. So if we aim for sparse connectivity, for instance, we want that the matrices in these F1 linear maps are sparse. So to see which are in some sense the main um, theoretical directions, one needs to understand, to actually fully understand neural networks. Let us just on one slide go through the action of if I would like to employ a neural network to learn a complicated function. So I have a function which is in the background. Um, usually it's on some, some lower dimensional um, manifold. And for instance, here, computer scientists like to separate cats from dogs. So in one area, you have cats sitting. In the other area, you have dogs sitting. And maybe you would like to classify those. So you would like to map the cats to one and the dogs to two, for instance. So you have samples of this function from which you want to learn the entire function. Then the first question is which architecture to choose. And there are actually a lot of parameters you need to choose beforehand. You need to choose how many layers to take how many neurons in each layer, which activation function, maybe you don't take a fully connected network, but you pre-select certain entries of these matrices from your F1 linear map to be equal to zero to already start with, a, let's say, a sparsely connected network, which is then also good typically for the training phase. Once you've decided upon that, then you train your neural network, so you solve this optimization problem, um, where here you have your sample values, your, your uh, labels, f of xi. This is the network evaluated in your samples, and you would like this to be close. You choose a loss function, which is suitable for your setting, maybe the square loss. And also you choose a, um, a, regular, a regularizer, maybe the uh, little l1 norm to ensure that you have a sparsely connected network. This you usually solve by gradient descent, and then you aim for that your neural network is close to your function f. This is what you hope. And so from this, the natural theoretical directions arise. The first direction um, is expressivity. Uh, and we saw we first need to decide upon which architecture to actually choose. So this is what expressivity, the area of expressivity aims at. How powerful is the network architecture? Can we represent the correct functions? Um, Maybe can I, if I would like to have a certain approximation accuracy, can I do this with a sparsely connected neural network? Maybe I aim for an optimally memory efficient neural networks and so on. All those are questions which relate to expressivity and from a mathematical standpoint, the area which we need for tackling those are particular approximation theory, applied harmonic analysis. Maybe to some extent, this is the most explored area because there are also uh, a lot of results already from the, let's say, first wave of neural networks when we were considering shallow ones. The second direction is learning or optimization. So we need to understand the learning algorithm. What are the starting values? Does it converge? How fast does it converge? Is it stable? Uh, questions of this type, and there are typically areas in mathematics which are involved are, for instance, different differential geometry to understand the energy landscape optimal control optimization. The third area is generalization, uh, which is the out of sample error, because then in the end, we don't want, we, we not only want neural networks to perform well on the data it has, it has they have seen, but in fact out on out of sample data. And so for that, understanding this, we need learning theory, statistics, and so on. So these three areas uh, actually constitute the three error components of a statistical learning problem. Uh, and so we can view a neural network as a statistic learning problem. And then these are the canonical three directions we need to uh, understand and we need to uh, estimate and bound the error of those. But then there's another area which takes a different approach. And so this approach is, I already have a neural network which was trained, but I don't know how it was trained. I just have it. And that's a situation we will always encounter in the future. We get the neural network from somewhere. It is on the chip already, and we need to understand how it operates. And that is the area of interpretability. 
So this aims to ask the question, why did, for instance, a trained deep neural network reach a certain decision? Which components of the input do contribute most? And maybe how uncertain is the decision? No? So this requires information theory, uncertainty quantification. No? So you see, I mean, it's a bit different. It's a bit different perspective from this. No? So these topics aim more to understand also if we, we have a neural network and we train it, and we, let's say, act ourselves to get uh, a good neural network. This is more I already have the neural network. It is trained maybe by someone else. And now I would like to understand it afterwards. And so this is the area which uh, this talk is about, um, interpretability or explainability, some people also call it. So the question is, I have a trained uh, neural network. Typically, I don't know what the training data is. I also don't know how it was trained. And so what I would like to open now is the black box of this neural network. I want to understand how it operates. Why is this important? Well, I mean, one uh, example might be, let's say you applied for a job, your job application was rejected, and maybe, or most likely in the future, these rejections uh, might be uh, suggested by new network-based algorithms. And so certainly uh, the applicant wants to know the reason for this. And so the one who delivers the um, decision need to basically ask the algorithm, what are the main criteria for reaching this decision? And in the end, I mean, the vision for the future might be that you would like to have explanations of a decision which are indistinguishable from a, an explanation of a human being. But you see, I mean, this is actually um, a very difficult vision because also the decision or the explanations of different human beings are different. But still, I mean, this is something which one might aim for. And there are already several approaches which uh, tackle this problem. So for instance, there are gradient-based approaches um, which just look at the difference um, of the neural network on certain types of data. There are approaches which are called backwards propagation methods, which basically, if you have a decision, back propagate things through the neural network to the input layer, um, there are surrogate-based models, uh, methods, game theoretic methods. Also, oh, there's already a lot of out there. Um, I would like to introduce here a new approach, which to my mind um, has a bit more mathematical foundation, which is also the purpose of this workshop. Okay, so the main goal is um, as follows, as I said, we have a black box predictor. We want to understand its decision. And let's make a small example here. Let's assume I have um, a three and my neural network now also said and decided that this is a three. So we have this, this, this area here. So now you want to know which areas are most important for this decision. And so what you would like to hope for is maybe that these openings here are important because otherwise it would be an eight and also maybe this area is important. But these areas here, these blue areas, are actually count against the decision because this seems to imply that this curve is closed. Vice versa, if this is decided to be an eight, then these openings count against it because these are gaps which an eight should not contain. Whereas maybe these parts count towards this being decided to be an eight. Okay, so if we have now a classification and um, typically these algorithms of interpretability target networks which are used for classification, then um, we ask the question, which features are most relevant for the decision? And as you saw here, the features which are taken are usually pixels. No? So usually, I mean, we deal with an imaging setting and so pixels are treated separately and each pixel is given let's say a, a value which indicates how important this pixel is for reaching that decision. But then, I mean, one can also think of why considering single pixels, why not considering combinations of pixels? For instance, if you want to decide whether something um, is, is a beach, then you look at the water and maybe these 
wavy structures of the water. I mean, the whole structure is important, but not just each single pixel. And also one can think of um, in the future to incorporate additional knowledge. But most algorithms right now are at that stage that they put heat maps on the image and then decide for each pixel itself. And also, I mean, certainly one can ask how certain is the decision? So what I would like to discuss with you uh, now are tackling the following challenges. Um, as I said, we would like to discuss and not discuss, we would like to um, decide what is most relevant in a mathematical sense. What we will see is a rigorous definition of relevance, uh, which is given by information theory. We would like to discuss what are good relevance maps because um, certainly one always aims for an optimum. And for this, we will formulate interpretability as an optimization problem. We aim to compare different relevance maps. And so for this, we will introduce a canonical framework for comparison. And also the question is how to extend it to other modalities than images. And what I will introduce here is a conceptual very general and flexible interpretability approach. Okay, so let's start with um, the relevance mapping problem. So what's the situation we consider right now? Well, I mean, we have a classification function from let's say zero one to D with D components into the interval from zero to one. And I have an input signal. So right now I don't care whether this is a neural network or not. It's just a classification function. Oh, and so, I mean, this will be classified as a monkey. So for instance, phi maps this image to the value 0 0.97. This might map phi might map this image to 0 0.07. So then it's not a monkey. So what we would like to do now is we would like to determine the relevant components. So I have my original image X. So the original image will be always denoted by X in the future. And I would now like to understand which components are relevant. And so here I again take pixels. These will be my relevant components. So the relevant components will be a subset. And this I will always denote by capital S. No, so S is now a subset of one to D of the indices of my um, entry vector. Ideally, what I aim for here is that S is small. I would like to have very efficient and concise explanations, which typically one also hopes uh, humans will give. Um, but the complement is then deemed to be non-relevant. No? So okay. So now comes um, one of the important slides. So what we will now do is we will um, use rate distortion theory for getting a framework for the decisions. So what does rate distortion theory do? We have two persons which are usually called Alice and Bob. Alice has a message and Alice would like to send this message to Bob. She would like to send it in a very, let's say, efficient way, but in such a way that Bob still understands the message. So what Alice sends is the rate. So I aim for a small rate. And let's say the error which Bob makes in deciding or in, in understanding what uh, the message is, is the distortion. Uh, so the distortion is what, what comes, uh, what message Bob reaches versus the original message. Okay, so what does it have to do with our setting? I have my original image and I have my decide my, my classification function, say the neural network. So now let's just let's, um, imagine Alice and Bob both have the same neural network. And Alice has this original image. She now would like to transfer this to Bob, but in an efficient way. So she does want to send certain pixels to Bob. And the pixels she sent are, well, I mean, the relevant part. So she sends 
a partial part of this image, capital S to Bob, in such a way, hopefully, that although she just sends a few pixels, the decision in the end will be the same. So now Bob has a slight problem because he only has these pixels, but the neural network operates on complete images. So he needs to obfuscate it to a complete image and um, a seemingly good way to not distort the meaning too much is to just obfuscate it by random pixels. Then he puts this in the neural network file to reach a decision which is hopefully not too far from the decision from else. So the obfuscation is as follows. We have um, random pixels, a random noise vector, and the Y, which Bob now puts in his neural network, is composed out of on the S part on of X and on the complement of uh, the noise vector. OK, so maybe because that's an important part, I would like to um, ask here if there are any questions at, at this point already. Good, so this is copied from the previous slide. I have my classification function, my input signal, and then y. Now the distortion is not too difficult to figure out. It's the difference between the uh, classifications and take the square difference and the expected value. And then what I aim for is that the decision uh, that the distortion is small, less or equal than some epsilon, and I minimize over the weight, I minimize over the number of pixels. Uh, and so this I would then call um, a relevance map. Uh, so the, the relevant pixels are those which minimize um, this optimization problem. Good, so this is a slight problem because finding the minimizer is actually quite hard. I mean, you can write it down nicely in a mathematical framework, but actually computing it is, is impossible. Um, and so let me uh, give you the intuition there. You can, um, we can now consider the binary setting for these results. So phi now maps from a binary vector to either zero or one. So these are the signals and then my noise is a uniform distribution on zero, one to D. And this is not a big restriction or it's not very far from what we aim for, namely studying neural networks, because uh, this is, you can view this as a special case of a, uh, of a neural network because Boolean functions, you can actually interpret as ReLU neural networks. Ah, so if this is hard to compute, I mean, then special case of neural networks are hard to compute. Ah, and so what, what we can prove there is that deciding whether the, if I go back to so this R of epsilon is this rate distortion function, so this was the minimum, uh, the minimal size of pixels. So this is already hard, it's NPPP complete, but also approximating it is also very, very hard. It's, this is NP hard. Now, what is this NPPP uh, complexity class that comes from artificial intelligence? It's basically planning under uncertainty. So you have a plan, an agent, you have some random, uh, behavior, and so uh, you would like to compute the success probability. So this belongs to this class NPPP. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, so computing this uh, seems to be impossible. So what do you do if something is very hard? Um, well, you relax. Ah, and so the problem, as you can imagine, is because it's a discrete problem, so here I have my relevant set. I only have pixels which belong to it or which do not belong to it. And then I obfuscate it as we discussed. I have my distortion and I have my rate. And now I make it continuous to relax it. Instead of just having, let's say, the world being black and white, I have a lot of shades. So every pixel is assigned a vector between zero and one. The obfuscation then basically works the same with the dot product. The distortion is the same. And the rate, instead of counting the number of pixels, or the number of entries in this vector S is now the little r1 of. And so 
Now you can formulate it as an optimization problem. What you want to optimize is you want to minimize the distortion and you want to minimize at the same time the rate, which is the little l1 norm. And lambda is as usual the regularization parameter balancing between both. So this is an optimization problem subject to, well, certainly that S is in this interval from zero to one to D. Uh, so this is what we, what we aim to solve. And this gives us a vector S, which is then our, our heat map, but we have it formulated as a very precise optimization problem. Okay, so how, how can we compute it? Um, you see the distortion, you can actually write in this way and express in this way. Um, at the same time, we can compute the expected value of Y and the covariance matrix of Y in these um, and write it, write it out. But in fact, what you need here is not the expected value of Y, but of Phi of Y and the covariance not of Y, but of Phi of Y. So how do you bring this now? Um, if you know those, how do you compute then the expected value and covariance after you applied the classification function phi? Well, I mean, there's a generic approach, say the Monte Carlo approach where you sample a lot and um, then estimate using the sample mean and sample covariance. Or if you know a bit more about the structure of phi, in this case that it has a compositorial structure if you um, view it as a, or if it is a neural network, you have these different layers, um, then you might would like to consider propagating the distribution through the layers to get then in the end from these, the expected value and covariance of phi of y. So let's take a um, closer look at this. Let's assume, I mean, this is my input distribution, uh, normal distribution. And now I would like to propagate this through my neural network. If I propagate it through the affine linear map, I again get a Gaussian distribution. So nothing happens there. Uh, the problem occurs if now I propagate it through the ReLU, to the ReLU activation function, because then a certain part is cut off and I certainly don't have any Gaussian anymore. And so what I then need to do is I need to take the closest moment matching output distribution. And then I keep going and propagate through the neural network. Okay, so let's, let's look at some uh, numerical experiments. So how do the other numerical experiments set up? Well, I mean, each time I have my neural network, which is fixed, it is there, as we already discussed in the beginning, I cannot change it. I would like to understand and analyze how it reaches decisions. So in this case, we look at MNIST, we take a fixed neural network, um, which has, in this case, a test accuracy of 99.1%. So this is the neural network which is given with, with different layers. Um, and in the MNIST, certainly everybody knows I have, I have 10, 10 classes. And so for instance, now looking at a six, we can see how different interpretability methods give different explanations why this particular neural network recognizes this as a six. So you see, I mean, different parts are highlighted here. This, you see our approach, the rate distortion explanation approach. Um, what you observe is that here, this part, which is exactly corresponding to this gap here is important. And we already discussed that this is actually a reasonable um, assumption to make, or let's say a reasonable um, ingredient for the neural network to consider. And also this area is. Um, is important. Yeah, so this, our explanation method tells us that the neural network looks particularly at that part for recognizing this as a six. And then you see what other methods 
aim for or look at. I mean, here it is also a bit this part in between, but uh, the sensitivity analysis, um, which looks at the gradient, is typically very, very pixely and very uh, noisy in a sense. And you see what other methods um, give as an explanation. Now, if you then compare, and we said um, it's also a question of how, how to how fairly compare. So here, um, one can take as a comparison the size of the number of relevant points, that's the rate, versus the error which you make. Ah, and so certainly the larger the part is, which you deem to be relevant, the smaller the error should be. And what you observe is that for our approaches, these curves decay the fastest. So at a very low rate, I already get a very low distortion. So with very few pixels, we already can see or we already get a very good explanation. And so then you might think, I mean, this comparison, which, which I show you here, is very unfair to the other methods because it's kind of very tuned to, to ours. But that's in a sense not true because if you look at other papers, so for instance, the deep Taylor approach, it is something similar which they also use for comparison. Yeah, so there, I mean, they basically also take um, the relevant pixels or all pixels and order them by the relevance and then starting in some sense um, obfuscating uh, and looking again at the distortion. So which is something similar to what you compare here. Now, this is a bit more extensive numerical experiment um, where we now take STL10 with a new network, which has a test accuracy of 93.5%. And you see the network is a bit more complicated here. Um, and again, you see different explanations. Again, you see here, I mean, in our case, it's a very sparse explanation, which is what you uh, also anticipate, since this is something we aim for, to have very few pixels, which are crucial. And here you see the neural network kind of looks at the, the head of the dog. And then you see other explanations uh, depicted here. And again, you can make this comparison between different approaches, uh, which you see here. So. Um, again, I mean, in the low rate regime, our approach then decays the fastest. Okay, so maybe I would like to make a small stop here if there are any questions at, at this point. Yes, I have a question, Gita. This is Renee. Mm -hmm. um, my question is um, how do different methods compare uh, depending on the task? So in particular, for example, in the MNIST data set, if the task was to classify a six versus all other digits, uh, that's a different task than classifying all 10 MNIST digits, and that will lead to different neural networks. And mm -hmm. arguably, the, even humans, the features that we might pay attention to when we discriminate classes might be different depending on what the task is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, that's true. Did, so did you observe differences in that regard, and how do we assess the, the correctness? Yes. So, so here, I mean, what we did, I mean, these are the experiments and some similar experiments which we drove. I mean, what, what you're asking are, um, let's say more extensive experiments where basically we not look at just one digit, but somehow um, at the at the entire part at, at let's say other tasks. So I I can only guess. I mean I, I don't have any experiments in this direction, but I think that's something worse. I mean which one definitely should should take a look at. I mean these are the experiments which typically are performed in. Um, let's say results concerning interpretability where one takes, let's say several images, one looks at different uh, explanations and then compares those. Uh, some even just compare visually. Um, these, uh, these experiments are simply plotting for that image, uh, what are the pixels that are most informative uh, as opposed to maybe looking at the entire class, which is all images of six and sort of producing a heat map. Mm -hmm. 
And, yeah, so and therefore, I... it's hard to understand whether they generalize to the entire class as opposed to the single image. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're saying is, I mean, so you want to look at, let's say, all different sixes and, and see whether, what the explanations for those sixes are overall. Whether there is a consistent explanation for the entire class as yeah. opposed to for a single instance. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's also difficult how to visualize this in a sense, because I mean, these sixes are all different. Um, I think it's, it might be very, I mean, very difficult to evaluate this in a sense. I mean, so these, these interpretability approaches are each time for one particular image. Now you can certainly compute these heat maps for each particular image of a six. Um, but then it's the question how to, I mean, you need to measure then somehow to compare all explanations of, of sixes from one, uh, one approach to the other. Um, so in the case of yeah. the MNIST, there generally there is no dramatic differences in translation, but say if it was recognizing faces, you could, mm. or, you know, some face task and you could say, is it paying attention to the eyes, regardless okay. of where they are? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. I think, yeah, I think that would be something important to consider um, right now. I mean, people typically look at just single image and not at, at the entire class um, and compare or that. I mean, that, that I haven't seen. Um, but I mean, you're absolutely right that this is something which, which should be considered. Hi, Gita. Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the RDE hardness. Uh, so um, do you, you, you proved that it's hard, but do you have a notion that is, it's hard for most uh, entries or like for most images? Or do you think that your relaxation is quite tight? And so this is for the binary setting. So it shows that, I mean, for, for the binary setting, if you have a binary classification function, then, then you prove hardness for, for any of those, for any function. Um, so now if you have, let's say, a not binary function, I mean, it could be that you can easily compute it. Um, but this shows, I mean, since uh, the binary setting is a special case of real neural networks that um, not overall, real neural networks, um, this, this relevance map can be easily computed. So there is a significant class for which you can prove that it's hard to compute. So but even like, this is the type of the run. Like L0 minimization is simply hard, but you can solve it a lot of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I mean, so, so as I said, I mean, so here, I mean, so these results, are for an arbitrary file, mm -hmm. an arbitrary binary function file. Thanks. I also had a small question, if you could. Hi. If you could go Hi. to the slide with the sixes. Uh, so it seems to me like the, well, it seems to me like the, the six that for instance that you're saying is the most compressible in a way, is still immediately compressible by, for instance, sampling through a line segment, meaning that if you have a line segment and given that we're in the MNIST data set, you don't need to send every pixel in there so you can just sample one, one in every three. And mm -hmm. so even though they're still, they're, they're as important, so they're all equally important, you don't need every single one of them. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm not seeing that being shown in this figure, so I wanted to, maybe ask for your explanation, perhaps I'm misunderstanding something. So what, what you're saying is, I mean, um, you could imagine that then the explanation could be even sparser by, let's say, pix sampling each, each, each third pixel. Yeah. Um, I mean, so for these experiments, um, so if I go back to the, um, to the optimization problem, so this is the optimization problem which which we compute. So this certainly depends also very heavily on the regularizing constant we choose here, the lambda. Yeah, so which balances in some sense between the distortion and the sparsity. 
So certainly, I mean, you can tune the lambda so that the sparsity becomes as small as possible. But then the distortion will, will, will go up. And so here, I mean, you can tune um, it even further down, but then the distortion will, will come up. So, so in a sense, I mean, so this is always, let's say, a trade-off between both. Nice. Any other questions at this point? Okay, good. So let's let's continue. Um, so which problem can you imagine here? So the first problem I would like to um, mention is that what we do. Remember, I mean, we have our relevant pixels, and then we obfuscate it with random noise. But then, I mean. If you do that, you will reach an image which might not be in the domain of the network. It might be something very different, very artificial. And so in that sense, then you can ask, I mean, if this really gives us meaningful information about why a network reaches the decision, if it's, let's say, out of the domain of the network. The second problem or problem is that the explanations are pixel-based. And often you might would like to have explanations which combine different pixels or maybe even something which goes beyond the imaging setting. And so what uh, we aim to do now uh, in the last minutes is for the first to also take the conditional data distribution into account. So imagine here that now you actually know the data distribution. It's a bit different from what I said before uh, where you just have the neural network and you don't know anything else. So now you know something about the conditional data distribution. And also for this, we will now ensure that all the different modalities can be handled. So let, let's recall again um, the problem, the optimization problem we solve. So our distortion was uh, the difference between phi of x, so phi applied to my original image, and phi of y where y was the obfuscated one. And then I take the expected value where the y now follows a certain distribution. And the distribution was in such a way that I have my pixels here and then I obfuscate them. But now what I would like to do is I would not like to obfuscate them with random noise because that could throw it very far off. It could create very artificial images which the network might deal with also in a very artificial way. I would like to obfuscate according to the conditional data distribution. And so there was an interesting paper by Chang, uh, Krieger, Goldenberg, and Duvenau, um, which considered, let's say, something um, in, in parallel, a, a different setting. So for a different task, um, so what they introduced in their work was they introduced an in-painting network, which now, if you have a part here, which in-painted the image according to the data distribution so that a critic has trouble deciding whether the obfuscation came from the data distribution or not. So you sample then from the conditional data distribution at hand. Yeah, so now we not only would not obfuscate with just random pixel, but we obfuscate in such a way that the image is then taken from the data distribution. And so this is what we now use here in our setting as our Y. So now, I mean, we have our, let's say, significant pixels. This was this S. Now remember, I mean, the little S meant that, I mean, we not have just zero or one, but I mean, we have every pixel is overlaid with a particular value. And then we have our in-painting network, which then ensures that what we get um, cannot be distinguished whether it came from the data distribution or not. And that we use as our Y. And so this is now the distribution we choose for Y being selected from. So now what are requirements for different modalities? What we aim for is, I mean, not only images, we can also apply it to other types of data. I will show you two examples in a moment, audio data and other types of data. And also, I mean, what you can certainly always do is, I mean, you can certainly transform the signal 
um, let's say via a Garber system or via a different system, by a dictionary, and then use this approach. And this will then allow for more complex features. Yeah, so you can, for instance, apply a wafer transform and then apply this approach. So then you will get, let's say, relevant wafer components. So let me show you two examples. I mean, one comes from audio data. So this um, data set are, uh, is audio signals of different instruments. And what we wanted to ask here is what is more important, the magnitude or the phase? And certainly, I mean, we, we already know, I mean, the phase is usually more important, but also, I mean, by this method, we can in some sense show this. Um, because what you see is if you compare, I mean, the phase, the importance of the phase is uh, much more than the magnitude. The other comes from a very different area from telecommunication. Um, and so the original work there um, is with, uh, again, Ron Levy and a PhD student of Giuseppe Caire, who's an um, electrical engineer at um, TU Berlin. And so there the setting was very different. So what is, the, what is the problem? The problem is as follows. I have a transmitter, which is this white point here. And I have a city map, which are these blue parts. And now what I would like to do is I would like to decide at each point somewhere how strong the signal still is. And you can imagine if you stand behind a building, the signal might be, not be that strong because the signal can only propagate through open spaces and might be reflected, but I mean, then you, if you're really in such a corner, I think everybody of us already had the experience, experience that, I mean, then the signal is actually quite um, weak. And so now, I mean, if we estimate this mass map, then what we saw, and so the way we estimated it, I mean, here, these uh, red parts, these red points are humans which have um, which have a cell phone, and so these are sample values. And then, I mean, this radio unit is a certain uh, double unit, double uh, neural network, which then computed this uh, radio map, so this black and white image, which you see in the background lying. But then you see something curious here, because there's this uh, black shadow, which tells us that apparently, I mean, that there the reception is very weak which is actually quite astonishing because it's right in front of the transmitter, this white part here. And so the question could be, um, why did the neural network compute this uh, black part here? Is it not just an artifact or is, it, is there a reasonable explanation which the neural network used? And so the explanation then, I mean, why this approach is that these pixels which are here are actually the reason why the network plotted this black shadow. Uh, and so these pixels, um, the humans which were standing there had a bad reception. And because of that, the network put this black area here. And so you can imagine in the city map, maybe this building was missing. So we have this missing building, the people observe that you have a bad reception and therefore the neural network computed the radio map in such a way that it put this black part here. Uh, so that way you can also ask more complicated questions about outputs of neural networks. Okay, so let me finish my talk with uh, some conclusions. I think in general, I mean, deep learning, we all know, um, have impressive performance in various tasks. So in particular also, and this I didn't mention explicitly, inverse problems, also partial differential equations, uh, on the theoretical side, there are large gaps, in particular in these areas, expressivity, learning, generalization, which I uh, discussed that these constitute the three components of the error of a statistical learning problem. And then this area of interpretability, which is somehow also um, a more recent, uh, let's say, research direction, which people became interested in. Then, I mean, we focused on interpretability um, and we saw that, I mean, one key question is also what is actually relevance? Because if you would like to aim for detecting relevant pixels, you first need to decide what is actually relevant. So what we did was, 
we provided a mathematical notion for relevance based on right distortion theory. This unfortunately led to a definition which is and be hard to compute. Um, but then if you relax it, you get a flexible, you get a, an approach which you can compute. And if you also combine it with, um, as we saw with, with guns, so with in painting guns, you get a very flexible approach which you can also use for different modalities. And I also showed you some numerical experiments which showed that, I mean, for, uh, let's say for classical examples, um, it, it outperforms other methods at small rates. And with this, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ta, uh, for the great uh, presentation. And uh, we can take a few questions from the audience. Hi, so I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So sure. regarding the expert, sorry. I hear you, you, you can speak. Okay, so regarding the experiment you did, for instance, with the neural network that trained up to 99.1% and you then you trained with, and then you tested the, the input six and you checked the, the pixels that were most important. Did you, for instance, grab the same figure of the same number six, rotate it, and then see what were the most important to check if the rotation that, that's a good, good, very good point. We, we, we didn't do that, but I think that would be, would be interesting to see if it's in that sense rotation variant. So if it's in that sense meaningful, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. So any other questions? Uh, yes, I have, uh, hello. Um, I'm Zi Chen, a PhD student from EC University of Utah. Um, I found that your, uh, your optimization uh, your objective function in the optimization, it involves noisy input. So for different noisy input, it has different uh, objective function and also different solutions. Uh, yes. So do we need to like uh, extract multiple distortions, uh, multiple noise, and then average over the DS? So the DS, I mean, I can show you how it was defined. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so the DS is actually the expected value over um, this term or here, as you correctly stated, in the Y you have the noise. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, it's the, the expected value and the random part here is in the Y, the noise. So, 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 so that, that's, that's the D of S. Oh, I see. Then, yeah. So actually when we do the uh, optimization, we just, uh, Average over multiple, yes. Yeah, I mean, you compute the expected value for that, right? Like, like we usually do. You have different, let's say, samples, and then you, you compute, yeah, the, the average in a sense. I see. Okay, thank you. So, uh, any other questions? I think we can take one more from the audience. Uh, if not, I, uh, I may have a question. Um, so, so kind of follow up on what Renee said. Um, so this, you know, the framework is just not limited to uh, a single image, right? So you actually be able to, is it possible to extend this to sort of the family of or each class of the images to try to find out what uh, features are collectively identified by, by the network that are most informative? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you would you would then apply this to each single image and would get, let's say, um, a collection of of explanations, which you then would need to compare in a sense to extract what are the key key features. So you could imagine if you have these sixes, for instance, um, that then if you mm -hmm. let's say have different types of sixes, that maybe it's always this part, this open gap, which would then be in some sense a universal, let's say. Yeah explanation so but yeah i mean or, we, or you, you look for some kind of group sparsity or joint uh, representation in, in either the neurons or some of the um I, i'm just speculating right so and it could be some kind of collectively sparse or collectively explainable by some sparse uh, coefficients and so on in some representation i guess you would want so, yeah. each image to, to be explainable by a sparse set of features, but then you would need to augment the objective with expected loss over the set of all images in addition yes. to the, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, concerning concerning sparsity, uh, as I said later, I mean, you could certainly, for instance, compute a wafer transform, a different transform of this image, and then look at those um, coefficients, and then look at those coefficients yeah. to see which ones are more important, which will be even sparser than what would you have here, and which might give also a better means to compare it to different explanations of other sixes or explanations to other other sixes of the same class. Mm 